The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Glory to you, O Lord. While Jesus was speaking, a woman from the crowd called out and said to him, Blessed is the womb that carried you and the breast at which you nursed. He replied, Rather blessed are those who hear the word of God and observe it. The Gospel of the Lord. In our first reading that we heard from the book of Revelation, it talks about uh, how John saw the Ark of the Covenant. In our understanding of this through Scripture, which it, when we hear the work, our word Ark of the Covenant, we should automatically think of two things. One, the Old Testament, and two, is the church has always seen Mary as the Ark of the Covenant, right? She carried the covenant within her womb. She is the Ark of the Covenant. But for the Jewish people in Jesus' time and in the time that John was writing the gospel, for them to hear that John had this vision of the Ark of the Covenant would terrify them. It would scare the living bejesus out of them, you know? Why so? Because the Ark of the Covenant had been lost, if you remember, during King David's time. The Ark of the Covenant had been lost during one of David's battles it had kind of been sieged and taken off and it had never been found again during David's time. And so the Ark of the Covenant had disappeared, but what was so significant about that Ark? It was what was inside of it, right? Not because it was a beautiful gold thing with seraphs on the top and it was made 40 cubits by 30 cubits by 10 cubits. No, it was what was inside of that Ark. The same thing about the Blessed Virgin Mary. What was inside of her what was, was what was important. And it's what Mary's life and her assumption into heaven all points towards, and that was what was in the ark of her womb, Jesus Christ. So what was in the ark of the covenant, of the old covenant? Why would the Jewish people be so terrified to hear of this vision? First of all, the covenant of God, the Ten Commandments, the, the Word of God to Moses that he brought down from the mountain, that Word of God becomes flesh in the Blessed Virgin, Virgin Mary's covenant womb, the, her ark womb. That covenant becomes real and alive and takes on uh, human flesh. It's called the incarnation. So that Word of God through the covenant, the Ten Commandments, was contained within that ark of the covenant. Another thing that was in there was manna. You remember the manna? We've been reading through the Gospel of John chapter 6 on Sundays and how the Israelites were in the desert and they were grumbling and they were hungry and it mentions how they, God gave them manna from heaven, the bread of angels. Well, some of that manna from those early Israelite people wandering in the desert was maintained, was kept. And some of that manna, that gift of bread from God was kept inside of that Ark of the Covenant as well. And of course, we understand that in, in the sense of Mary, that that bread of heaven took flesh in Jesus Christ and becomes the real and true Eucharistic food that we consume, the bread from heaven and the Eucharist that we celebrate here. And the third thing that was inside of that Ark of the Covenant was the stump of Jesse, or the stump of Jesse that blossomed you remember that blossoming stump of Jesse? And Jesus is of that stump of Jesse. And so it's that lineage connecting Jesus throughout all of history. All of this is connected to Mary in her womb. Once we understand all of this, we know the vision of John very well in the book of Revelation. So Mary's about to conceive and give birth to this covenant this living, breathing, true, real, flesh-and-blood covenant in her womb. And so what's happening? 
The devil wipes away the stars so it's dark, and he waits there at her womb because he wants to consume this child. He wants to wipe this child off the face of the earth. If Mary has always been seen as the Ark of the Covenant, just like that Ark of the Covenant and before, Mary has also always been seen as a type or a prototype of the church. And in the same way, this message of Revelation is true for us. That the devil wants to come and wipe out the stars and wait there to take out the church. Wait there to destroy us. It's a pretty grim image, but that's not the way the book of Revelation ends, right? The book of Revelation is Jesus is caught up into heaven, as we heard, and then later after Mary flees to the desert and then she hides in a cave, Mary herself is taken up into heaven. So it's this beautiful image that we didn't get in our gospel reading or in our first reading today from Revelation. But it's this beautiful image of Mary being taken up into heaven. John gets this in this revelation, this beautiful revelation. And what it is, is as I said in the beginning, is a message for us. If Mary is a type of the church, if Mary is a type of that Ark of the Covenant that connects all of history to Jesus Christ, that she's also that type that connects all of our destiny to Jesus Christ for all of us. She has this message, her assumption, as Pope Benedict said, is one of the most important feasts that we celebrate. Her message is that we too will be caught up into heaven. If she's an image of the church, then what this feast tells us and what it assures us in our faith is that at the end of our lives, after we have gone through the battle of battling Satan throughout our whole lives, just like Mary in that image, we too will be caught up into heaven. We too are not going to be left out in a desert. We're not going to be like the the series that terrified so many people in the 80s and 90s that left behind. You know, all these stories and grim images of the people that are left behind. It's all false. It's all a fear tactic that came out of that book of Revelation. But the beauty of that is not to scare us. The beauty of the book of Revelation is to give us this heavenly promise. And remind us, yes, of the reality of evil in the world, that the devil never stops seeking us out, searching through the desert, waiting at the womb to consume us as we're born into everlasting life. But the reality is, the truth of Jesus Christ is revealed to us in the Feast of the Assumption that we will be taken to heaven, that we will be glorified with Mary in heaven. This is what God's plan is for us, right? Do you remember the old Baltimore Catechism? Why did God create us? To know, love, and serve Him in this life and in the life to come. It's our destiny. Our destiny is the same as Mary's. Mary proves that for us and gives us, in a sense, proof that our human flesh, that Jesus took on himself as he was formed in her womb, that Ark of the Covenant of her womb, he took on our flesh so that he could raise our flesh. And he proved it by doing it with Mary. So how do we follow that example? How do we live that so that we too will inherit that same promise? so that this feast truly does become a glorious feast for us to raise our hearts and our voices in thanksgiving and in anticipation of not only our destiny, but our hope and our prayer and our faith of our loved ones that have gone before us, that they have received that destiny as well, that that promise of the assumption of Mary is the same for our loved ones as well. And we heard that in the gospel today a very short gospel that the deacon chanted because it was so short. If it were a longer gospel, he promised he wouldn't have chanted it. But it was a short gospel, so it was beautiful to chant that. Our chanting enhances our liturgy. And so I give the deacon all credit for for chanting. And it just magnifies how beautiful it is to to sing the Word of God, to, to really lift our hearts and our voices. But it says, she heard the Word of God and acted on it. Mary heard the word of God proclaimed to her from the angel Gabriel. She will conceive and bear a son. And she acted on it. 
So that's our challenge today as well. As we celebrate the Assumption, as we look forward with great joy and anticipation of our own triumphant entry into heaven, of our own victory over the devil, which is possible. Mary proves that to us. It's possible. As we look forward to that, we do as she did. We hear the word of God and we act on it. One last story before I conclude. I read a beautiful story the other day in anticipating uh, this feast day of a, a true story of a priest who visited a prison inmate. And this priest visited this inmate, and it's no coincidence that today the unfortunate event of um, Nebraska executing its first um, death row inmate in 20, over 21 years. But I did hear this story before that it all happened, and so we continue to pray for our state, for our legislature, for our country and our world to, to stop uh, paying back an evil with another evil. It's never right to, to pay back evil with evil. But the story goes is this priest visited this man who was on death row, who was just a hardcore criminal, didn't want to talk to anyone, didn't want to visit anyone. But this priest thought, maybe I'll just go and give it a try, one last try, to go and convert this man, to go and find some sense of hope for this man, to show him that God is merciful and God is loving. So he goes and he talks and he talks and the man doesn't respond the man doesn't say anything. He talks a little more. He prays. He opens scripture. He doesn't say anything. He gets out his book of blessings to give him the last rites or anointing of the sick. He doesn't respond or doesn't say anything. And the priest just at the last, in one last attempt before he walks away, just says, will you just do one thing for me? Just one thing. And the inmate thought to himself, well, whatever. He's going to leave. I'm going to get him out of my hair. I'll do it. So he says, okay. So the priest says, I'd like you to do one thing. I'd like you to say the Hail Mary with me. Just once. The Hail Mary. This priest knew the power of a simple prayer of Mary. He knew the power of intercession of the Blessed Mother Mary and how she loves us so much as a mother, she wants the same hope of the Assumption for all of us. She wants us all to enter into heaven, even the most hardcore criminal. Mary wants that. That's a loving mother, right? So this priest kneels down beside this inmate, and he begins to pray the Hail Mary, and before he gets further than Hail Mary, full of grace, the inmate breaks down in tears. The priest finishes. The inmate is not able to finish the prayer. The priest finishes, and the inmate falls to his knees and confesses. How beautiful that the Blessed Mother affords this man before his execution a chance for reconciliation. A chance to come clean, in a sense, with God. A chance, but, and it all came through the Blessed Mother. It all came through Mary's motherly care and how she loves us so much, each and every one of us, she wants that for all of us. She wants all of us to join her in heaven. So today as we celebrate this feast, I just ask you to reflect on Mary's love for you. True story, that story of that inmate who could have such a powerful conversion by simple words as a Hail Mary. And that maybe all of us, as we continue to pray tonight and as we go out from here, that we might have the same courage as that priest to just pray, to just pray a Hail Mary for those who don't believe, for those who might find it difficult to believe that there is a place for them in heaven. Trust me, Mary's love can do a lot. She can change a lot. She can change our hearts, and she intercedes on our behalf with her son. She can change her son's mind. <laughs> Mothers can change their son's minds, right? My mother changed my mind many times. So as we celebrate this Feast of the Assumption, it just drives home the power of Mary's prayer, 
the power of Mary's love that she wants to welcome us into heaven with her. And, and what do we do? We hear the word of God proclaimed to us. We hear the word of God, which becomes truly the body and blood, soul and divinity of Jesus on the altar, and we act on it. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.